as we turn to look at how indigenous and Black Lives Matter activists here in Canada are working together to address state violence and neglect. Last month, First Nations people occupied the offices of Canada's Indigenous Affairs Department to demand action over suicides, as well as water and housing crises in their communities. The protest came after the Cree community at Ottawa Piscot declared a state of emergency over attempted suicides. The community of 2000 saw 28 suicide attempts in March alone, and 11 on a single night in April. Protesters set up occupations inside and outside the offices of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada in Toronto, Regina, Winnipeg, and uh, Gatineau, Quebec. Among those who took part in the occupation of the office here in Toronto were local Black Lives Matter activists, including Yusra Kogali. This is our family. We know that the only way that we can be free and fight against the systems working to kill us is to stand with each other and stand by, by each other. We're both targeted by the state in, in similar ways. The ways in which there is mass incarceration in our communities, police violence, a lack of access to proper housing. You're, you're dealing with so much more than just, you know, cuts and scrapes or lacerations. You're dealing with whole, you know, a whole 500 years of genocide that these people are, are, are having to deal with on a daily basis. And we're basically making sure that uh, the people of Ottawa, Piscat, and James Bay in general, and, and uh, northern uh, Manitoba, that they know that people ha are hearing what's going on, and that, uh, that they know that people are backing them. These children feel like their only way out is to take their own lives. James, crisis in Canada needs to stop. Protesters occupying an Indigenous Affairs office here in Toronto, Canada last month. Just weeks earlier, Black Lives Matter activists in Toronto launched a 15-day encampment outside police headquarters. The protest followed news there would be no criminal charges for the police officer who fatally shot a South Sudanese refugee named Andrew Loku last July. A police watchdog said Loku, who had a history of mental health problems, was wielding a hammer when he was shot. But a witness said Loku's hands were at his side. Among those who turned out in force at the encampment outside Toronto Police Headquarters were First Nations activists. Well, to talk more about this coalescing of movements, we're joined now by four guests. Erica Violet Lee is with us. She's an Indigenous rights activist with the Idle No More movement and a student at the University of Saskatchewan. Hayden King is an Indigenous writer and lecturer at Carleton University's School of Public Policy in Ottawa. Leroy Newbold is a member of the steering committee for Black Lives Matter Toronto and director of the Black Lives Matter Freedom School Project. And Desmond Cole is a journalist and columnist for the Toronto Star and radio host on News Talk 1010. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Um, Erica, why don't we begin with you and talk about um, the protests and the occupation you were engaged in and the issues you feel are critical to raise uh, for people, an audience that's global. Um, I think that recognizing that we're on stolen Indigenous land is the key to, to understanding solidarity between these movements, to understanding why Indigenous youth are being pushed to, to kill ourselves in a, in a colonial context and to recognize that police violence is impacting black lives, indigenous lives, and racialized lives in this country. And sometimes we don't even think about the history of, of, of resistance. And, and so to, to see the occupations of INAC and to see the occupations of um, the police department is, is an example that we're taking back this land and we're taking back our lives. And INAC is, for people not in Canada, the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Department yes. of, of, uh, of the Canadian government. And what were you demanding at that moment? And ultimately, why did you leave? So the occupation was in response to youth suicides in Attawapiskat and all Indigenous communities in Canada. And, and the reason that um, the people wanted to take over these offices is to say, these are government offices that are benefiting off of Indigenous resources, Indigenous land, and yet we live in poverty, and yet we are, we're not represented in education. Um, things are dire, and it shouldn't, we shouldn't be poor and hopeless on our own lands. Hmm. 
<clears throat> Leroy, you are a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. You're joining together with First Nations people. Talk about this coalescing of movements. So with the uh, 15 day occupation of Toronto Police Headquarters, we were really aware that the issues that we face in black community in terms of the lack of value of black lives in the eyes of the state and the police is very parallel to issues that indigenous communities face. When we were occupying Toronto Police Headquarters, we were conscious of the fact that this is um, a space that is occupied by indigenous activists many times around the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. And the similarities of issues that both of our communities face in terms of interventions by the state around um, CAS, in terms of education. CAS is? Um, it's the American uh, sort of um, version would be Child Protective Services. Mm -hmm. um, and the issues that we face with police violence, the issues that we face in terms of when we lose community members and the police don't have any reaction to that. Or and, and the particular occupation that just took place, mm -hmm. or the protest outside police headquarters. Um, talk about who Loku was and what you came to understand about what happened. Mm -hmm. Andrew Loku was a refugee to Canada. He was from South Sudan. And his family came here for what many immigrants come here for, protection or a better life. And and he was shot by the Toronto police on Eglinton West. He was somebody who was living with mental health issues. And the police shot him within 60 seconds of arriving at his apartment complex. So that was something that was deeply disturbing to our community and that we've been working with that family um, for the past couple of years uh, to seek justice. So. Um, directly before the occupation of Toronto Police Headquarters was when we found out that the officer who killed Andrew Loku would not be charged hmm. and that there would be no justice there. I want to turn to the case of Jermaine Carby, who was shot and killed by police during a traffic stop in September of 2014. He was a passenger in the car. This week, a coroner's inquest into Carby's death revealed Carby had been subjected to a street check known as carding. This is Carby's cousin, Latanya Grant, speaking to a reporter. The officer said he was done his highway traffic stop when he um, finished with the driver, so he had no reason to speak to my cousin after that, nor did he have a reason to ask for his ID. I don't know what got them pulled over. I just know that they weren't supposed to be pulled over, and if they were pulled over, they weren't supposed to be talking to my cousin, Jermaine Carby. If they did not speak to him and card him, Jermaine Carby would still be here today. We're also joined by Desmond Cole, uh, who is a columnist for the Toronto Star, as well as a radio talk show host. Uh, Desmond, can you talk about the Canadian media's coverage of um, the issues of, for example, the killing of Carby as well as Loku? Well, I remember that Jermaine Carby was killed in September of 2014 in Brampton, which is a suburb of Toronto. And there was very, very little media coverage at the time of this event. And I remember it so well because a couple of months later, I actually took a trip down to Ferguson, Missouri. And I was covering the backlash after Darren Wilson was not charged in killing Mike Brown, the unarmed 18-year-old teenager there. And I saw thousands of people from Ferguson marching here in Toronto in solidarity with Mike Brown, but also talking about our own issues, talking about Jermaine Car uh, Carby and talking about other people in our communities here who have been killed uh, by police. And so the movement is an international movement. The movement is one where people are feeding off of each other. They're watching and learning and taking inspiration from one another. Uh, it's taken a lot of time, but I think that Black Lives Matter Toronto and many other groups in solidarity have been much more successful in recent months of raising this as a local problem. And the media has been very slow to respond. But I think the persistence of the activism is forcing more media coverage as time goes on. You wrote an article about your own experience with racism. Um, can you talk about what you wrote and the reaction to it? Well, I wrote about growing up in this part of the country, in the greater Toronto area, and facing systemic racism, being uh, second generation, uh, uh, 
Canadian. My parents are from Sierra Leone. And facing anti-black racism every day, facing it in school, facing it at work, and um, talking about how normal it really is. The reaction was an interesting one because a lot of people in our uh, city, which prides itself on being multicultural, they acted surprised. They acted surprised that this level of discrimination is so common. Uh, those of us who experience it are not surprised by it at all. And I think what was revealed is a certain naivety in Toronto where we ignore very obvious problems of racial discrimination and systemic racism because we want to tell ourselves uh, that's not happening here. And we especially want to tell ourselves that we are not the United States of America. Oh, we're going to go to break and come back to this discussion. Our guests are Desmond Cole, uh, who is a columnist with the uh, Toronto Star. We're also joined uh, as well by Leroy Newbold, who's with Black Lives Matter here in Toronto. Um, Erica Violet Lee uh, is with us, as well as, and we're going to hear from Hayden King, talking about Indigenous issues in Canada and how they're dealt with by the state. Stay with us.